Right, well, welcome to this second session of five minute um, <coughs> talks. We've got a slight change to the program. Professor Gable, Gable wasn't available this morning, so I see he's here now. So, this is presentation number six from the last session. And then we'll revert to the list as supplies. Uh, I haven't got a dog. I've got a duck. <laughs> so after five minutes, if you hear lots of quacking, we've got to stop. Okay. Um, plasma processing of biofuels. And uh, first of all, what is a plasma? Well, it's uh, sometimes called the fourth state of matter. If you heat the solid up from the liquid, you heat liquid up from the gas, if you heat it up a bit more, you get plasma. Now, plasmas are actually ubiquitous in the universe. Or, but not so much on, on here on the Earth. These are some examples of plasmas. This is uh, the Sun, of course, um, which is a big plasma, as stars are. This is the Aurora Borealis, lightning. And this is uh, an electric propulsion device, which is near and dear to my heart, that we work on in the lab, firing here. And this is something which we probably uh, well, would use and is used for processing all of our biofuels and, and other things. So why, why are plasmas used? Well, you get them up to very high temperatures, thousands of degrees and beyond, and you've got electrons, ions, and neutrals present, and at these high temperatures, you can more or less break up everything that's there into the constituent atoms, and so you get rid of all the nasty molecules, etc. And if you use a plasma, this, this, they are being used around the world. Uh, they are omnivorous, so they eat anything. So you can take household waste, as you can see some examples here, industrial waste, coal, and biomass. You feed it into this uh, process here, you gasify it, you've got the plasma torches here at the bottom, and what you get, the metals recycled, the inert slag comes out and you can use to make other things like ceramics and uh, pavements for roads, and then you clean up the gas and you get a synthetic fuel which is called syngas, and you can then generate um, power, or you can do other things with that same gas. So this is actually from um, something that I found on the web, which I knew about anyway, is Westinghouse in the USA uh, are actually making these plasma torches and supplying them to various countries around the world. So it, what my initial perceptions of what's going on in this field are as follows. Um, there's not much in the way of uh, work in the UK, and as far as I can make out, almost nothing in the way of research. There are one or two companies that are doing it in the UK on a commercial basis. Seems as nobody's interested research-wise. Research-wise, worldwide, uh, there's very little, it seems. There's some, but it's, uh, it's very much a, a, what shall we say, a, a macroscopic level, and people don't really look at what's going on in the interaction of the plasma with the the biofuel, uh, or the waste, or whatever it is. As I said, you can use it for many different things. So it's not easy to find out what the real gaps in knowledge are, but I've identified three potential things. One of, that we could contribute to, one is the electrode lifetime itself, because as you run these things, the electrodes get used up, they wear out, and typically you've got to, they last for maybe a few hundred hours and then you've got to replace them, so that obviously means downtime. Uh, the plasma itself, including the flow and the stability, and the stability particularly at the electrodes, and then the efficiency. Now, I'm not going to get into the efficiency because there are different ways of defining the efficiency, but overall, you don't want to have to use up a lot of power. You want it to be um, power, produ power production and net power um, gain at the, end of the, at the end of the process. So, what are my plans? Well, um, I've got three master students starting, uh, I think, uh, next month to look at the plasma processing of biofuels. In fact, I already talked to, to uh, Professor Taylor about this, and she seemed very interesting, and so we're, we're going to try and do some experimental work and some modeling, two doing experiments and mm -hmm. one doing modeling. modeling. Um, <coughs> possible PhD student on plasma modeling, and then I uh, hope to follow that up with an EPSRC proposal. Next up is me. <laughs> <laughs> so,
So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, the Power Networks Hub. Now, some of you may not be aware of this, but there's been a series of programs funded by EPSRC. Uh, the last big one was called Superchip, and um, that came in for quite a lot of criticism amongst the community because what EPSRC did was give large blocks of money to uh, various groups around the UK, and it was felt that it was quite selective and um, it didn't offer up opportunities for other people to actually get involved in energy research on a grand scale. So um, the process has been to move towards concepts where we use a um, two funding mechanisms. One is to create a hub or a central network. There's been one for power networks, one for marine, I think there's one for bio in the process of being sorted out. And then these have also been associated with grand challenges. I'm just going to talk about the power networks hub and what it's about because it's an opportunity for all of us to get involved. So one of the things that often gets forgotten, um, taken for granted, is the actual electrical power transmission network. And if you, I borrowed this from Imperial, uh, if you look in terms of how we use our energy, electricity only accounts for about 25, 28% um, by the end use. Most of that's in uh, charging a phone, running a washing machine, and lighting. And the big heat and thermal heat and transport loads are covered by other, other networks and, and processes. But the future is probably more electrical tra energy transport. And our system probably isn't in the best state to do that because most of it was installed up until about 1963. Quite a large majority is still running today. And so the aims of HubNet is actually to provide some form of research leadership. And we're seeing that in terms of there's uh, seven universities involved. Southampton's myself and Professor Swingler. Uh, Manchester, New, uh, Nottingham, Warwick, Cardiff, Strathclyde, and Imperial. And uh, we've got a range of expertise there. And part of our process is that we're to provide position papers, which are setting roadmaps for future research activity, which will be fed back into EPSRC. We're looking to fund innovative activity, and that's taking the form of offering PhD studentships. Uh, we were successful in the last round a PhD studentship, we managed to get a PhD student to, who's going to be working in um, uh, Knox on marine. <coughs> so the problems are separated <coughs> with buried uh, substance cables in marine. <coughs> uh, we, we're looking at providing mechanisms to add greater exchange of ideas, so this will probably take the form of workshops and other activities on a big website. <coughs> um, and that involves trying to get information from researchers who are working in related fields that can feed into activities for, for the power networks. We want to develop more research proposals, but not necessarily for ourselves, but more of a collaborative nature. And I see that as an opportunity for Southampton to actually look at the existing skills that we've got and try and bring some of that into our power networks. We're also looking to engage, that probably covers the engaging collaboration. And there's some, some stuff in there about international research interaction. I'm not really sure what we're going to do there. And uh, our PhD students that we're funding will take part in sort of national uh, meetings and uh, will enhance their training. We identified five specific areas. Some of these are very common. Smart grids, that's uh, been run by Stratified. Uh, mega grids involves activity from Southampton. So mega grids is concepts of connecting uh, ourselves with other with other states that have, have energy to spare. Hopefully, uh, smart grids is more about trying to control our our demand and, and bring some some more intelligence into the system uh, when it comes to how we generate and transmit. Um, a big area is how we manage what we've got already. And so that's bringing in concepts like uh, improving condition monitoring and prognostics and diagnostics, which again is, is probably towards the edge of what actually takes place in power networks research. Another big area is can we improve dielectric materials um, so we get better equipment in the future that's more efficient uh, and more resilient. And then the other thing is this realisation that the energy transport vectors are going to change over time. And how do we coordinate that and operate that 
when there's more and more uncertainty um, as time goes on. <coughs> so that's my talk. Next up, Professor Swindler can talk about um, the Mount Everest Grand Challenge. <laughs> BPSSC have funded uh, two major consortia to address grand challenges in the, in the area of power networks, or strictly energy networks, because we should be thinking more of, uh, of, of gas, hydrogen things in addition to electricity. But because of the interest of the people involved, everything just starts to slip back towards, uh, towards electricity. The, there are two large consortia. The one that we're involved in involves um, Imperial, Manchester, Scrap Five, kind of the usual, the usual suspects, I'm afraid. Um, and it's called the Top and Tail of Energy Networks. Well, why Top and Tail? Because in the short to medium term, nothing very much is going to happen to the basic infrastructure. So you'll still have gas pipelines. You'll still have overhead and underground electricity transmission laptop stations, nothing much is going to change very quickly. The wires into your house, you know, essentially you're going to end up with the same wires for the next 50 years. Even if we dig up every street in Britain, it's not going to be able to change that infrastructure very, very quickly. So, essentially what we're saying is that in the middle, the bulk of the transmission network will stay the same. It will have to operate more efficiently, it will have to be smarter. Where you're going to make big changes is at the, the very, very top the real bulk energy transfer between, uh, between, say, the UK and Europe, between different parts of the UK, and also at the bottom. Now, the idea of the bottom, I put here, the new tail, which is essentially, you won't be changing the infrastructure, you will be changing the amount of information you give to people. The hope there is that if you don't end up with a smarter network, you end up with smarter consumers, or at least consumers who've got no excuse for being bloody stupid. So that's the, uh, that's the theory. Where we come into this, we're interested in the very high power end, the very top end, and looking at how you can get um, the best transfer of energy into England. Uh, right, UK. Basically, what, we, what we've traditionally had is a lot of electricity generation around Nottinghamshire, around, uh, around Yorkshire. So essentially, the, the big coal fields producing bulk energy, shipping it into the southeast. That's the that's the, the simple plan for electricity transmission in the past. Um, Mrs. Thatcher, bless her heart, managed to do away with most of that. Didn't actually change the network very much because A, you can't change the network very much, and B, then the energy was being gassed, piped in from the North Sea, turned into electricity, pumped into the southeast. So nothing changed very dramatically. The future, the bulk energy of the future, is likely to be. Uh, a replacement of some of the old nuclear stations within England, and then getting a lot of energy from outside into England, particularly the southeast of England. And this will be transferred from offshore wind from Scotland, huge amount of offshore wind from uh, the North Sea in, and also we will rely a lot on interconnection between places like Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, France. There will be a lot more interconnection. It's these very big internet interconnections that interest us. In order to get electricity over uh, long distances and very high power, <coughs> you really need to go to DC rather than AC transmission. If you use AC transmission, all your cable looks like to the network is a big capacitance. And all the energy is wasted charging and discharging that capacitance. So you have to get away from that. You have to go to DC for long distances. We also need quite big links. Our ambition is for 10 gigawatts of power down a pair of cables. That is hugely challenging. At the moment, most of the links are about 1 gigawatt. Uh, you can get up to 2 gigawatts, but that in itself is challenging. So we're interested in big new DC cables. And in order to get the voltages and the currents required for this bulk energy transfer, you need a smart, or a, not a smart, but a, a brand new insulation, a much better insulation. And what we're looking at is nanocomposite insulation. 
So that is very finely divided filler within a plastic, a polyolefin like polyethylene, polypropylene. If you divide your, say, your silica filler so that it's in incredibly small pieces on the sort of nanoscale, then you're not just looking at a plastic with lots of mineral in it, because the interface between the, uh, uh, the, the filler and the plastic begins to dominate the properties. What we're interested in doing is choosing the best filler, the best polymer, getting the best interfacial properties, <laughs> and that will allow us <laughs> to stop. <laughs> from our point of view. Uh, how do we get the best out of one of these? Uh, high voltage cable. So we're really looking at three parameters. First, probably the most important, uh, is the current rating. So very simply, how much current can I pass down the cable for a brief amount of time? So how much power can I transfer? How much energy do I lose in the process? What are the losses? And what does, the, what does that mean in terms of the reliability of the system? So the existing methods are fairly straightforward just solving a thermal electrical coupled problem. Effectively, <coughs> if we look at the uh, problem we have, we have heat generation in electrical losses, AC resistances, dielectric losses of high voltages, and also uh, induced losses in our metallic sheet components. Uh, that's all generating heat. The limiting factor on the cable operation is actually the temperature of this bit here, uh, or this, uh, this polymeric material here, the insulation. Uh, if we exceed around 90 degrees C in conventional AC cable, we start to age the insulation very rapidly, uh, and our very expensive cable system will fail the furniture. We don't want that to happen. So effectively, <coughs> so what on the surface appears to be a very simple heat balance problem, actually uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because there's a lot of environmental variables uh, that we need to consider. So, what have we actually been doing in this area? This is sort of the potted summary in five minutes uh, over five years. Uh, seven or eight different projects I've been involved in. We started off from looking at what the existing international standards are, what the current methods are, working out how we can actually improve on them. So a lot of these calculations were done back in the 60s and 70s, on the back of an envelope. You didn't have a computer, you didn't have an option. Now that we have much more powerful numerical modeling techniques, uh, we can improve on that. So to take an example, here we have a 400 kV cable circuit joint bay. Uh, developed 3D finite element models that have helped National Grid to understand better uh, thermal transfer processes uh, in cooling systems for those joint bays and optimise the electrical performance. We move into cable tunnels. Uh, lots of these in London, uh, even more being built at the moment. Uh, we've redesigned the methodology for calculating uh, the thermal performance of those systems and uh, come up with a much more flexible approach. Uh, we look at cable troughs. Now we install cables in substations. Uh, some of the new designs, the only way to really model the thermal performance of that system uh, is to use techniques like computational fluid dynamics. So all of this sort of stuff is a little bit outside the comfort zone uh, of utility engineers, uh, and they want us to try and develop some better methods based on that uh, that they could then use themselves. Looking into the future, Steve mentioned the idea of a 5 gigawatt cable. Uh, we've been considering what the impact might be for very high temperature cable systems. We had uh, a novel insulation system that would allow us to go up to, say, 150 degrees C instead of 90 degrees C. What would that do in terms of the operational performance? How can we model it? And above all, would it be any use to us? Uh, and the answer is, in some cases, no. But there are some cases where it would give us some very clear benefits. So we've been trying to harness all of this R&D uh, to support the national grid uh, in their model development and how they actually model the network on a day by day basis uh, and how they verify that their installations are doing what they want them to do. Uh, these are multi million pound assets, uh, we don't want unexpected failures. So, a lot of these methods have actually been uh, commissioned by national grid, uh, and we have software builds of some of our new calculation methodologies uh, operational at the moment. 
the work we've done in cable tunnels and is influencing the design of future 400 cable projects uh, in London. Uh, it's about half a billion pounds of capital investment uh, that our employees are helping to design. Uh, the work is being carried forward uh, at an international level and is being recommended by the Seagray uh, working group in that area uh, for adoption uh, worldwide. And my current challenge is working on developing models uh, for the Western H50C link, uh, which is a much more complicated beast uh, than the standard AC cable network, lots more parameters. How can we model best uh, that cable system so that we can operate it to its maximum possible efficiency, <coughs> but without risking what is a capital investment of, in this case, uh, well over a billion euros? So that's a, a pretty quick highlight of uh, my research activities. Ten seconds to spare. <laughs> presentation from GoPal is on the smart grid. I'm uh, from um, the DIC group in ECS, uh, so it's an agency corruption and complexity group. I'm mainly working in the agent business computing part of the DIC group. Um, and we will talk a little bit about the projects that we have in the group uh, dealing with um, building uh, AI for uh, future smart grid. So we started work about three years ago on uh, applying some of our techniques to, um, to smart grids. Um, and we started with the vision that uh, the US had of the smart grid, basically. Um, what they said in, in, in their uh, smart grid 20 is that the uh, vision, um, imagine possibilities, electricity, and information flowing together in real time, near zero economic losses from outages, Etc. Et and we were expected to read all that. The key points that we focused on was the information aspect. So what, what's the information aspect of, 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 uh, of the smart grid? And particularly we're talking about electricity and information flowing together in real time. Suppliers competing in open markets and distributed intelligence and resources. So this is what we are very good at dealing with. In, in the we, we study large systems where a number of stakeholders have to act individually to optimize some, some, some objective and interact with other stakeholders in the, in, in the same environment um, in order to ma maybe maximize some global objective. Um, this may involve them negotiating with each other or, or sharing some, some kind of information. And more importantly, in some cases, they are very uh, self interested, so they might just want to optimize their, their, their own objective and therefore. Um, what you need to design for them is a, is a mechanism that will allow all of them to work together um, in order to, to make some global project. Um, in order to achieve this, we have a number of projects um, in, in the group. Um, the biggest one we have right now is, is ORCID, and uh, it's about building the science of human agent collective. So in, within ORCID, we, we started looking at uh, systems of, of agents where humans could also be agents in the system, so we're working with us. For example, here in Not we're Nottingham University, who are a big uh, HCI group, um, and we're looking at how humans will interact with systems um, where agents might be providing them with recommendations about how to use energy, um, might be automating some of the processes in the phone, maybe shifting the loads in the phone to certain times, um, or uh, just monitoring and, and helping them making sense of what, how they're using energy in the phone. Building Banter is another project that um, is led by Alex Rogers in the group. And that was a slightly funded project that looked mainly at an industrial setting. So it's a small scale industrial setting uh, kind of uh, project where it was more about building interfaces for uh, workers in, in, in factory to understand how, uh, how their actions impacted on, on the energy consumption of the, uh, of the, of the factory. Um, the IDS project is an industry funded project. So that, that's a very general project looking at um, various applications of smart grids. I'm going to come to all of them in a minute. But um, the focus has been on various things, um, looking at grid optimization and also home energy management. Um, and uh, intelligent agents for home energy management project, we have a post here with engineering guys, uh, is looking at home heating and how people's uh, behaviors uh, work with a sort of thermostats or when you can build a, a small thermostat into a home and, and looking at better visualizations of, of uh, your energy usage as well. So, I've already mentioned some of these elements, uh, but that's my closing slide. Um, 
So I'm going to just uh, go through each of them. So one key part of our work has been around home energy man management, as I said, and that's looking at how we can build smart thermostats or um, learning about the behaviors of, of, uh, of, of uh, homeowners in order to optimize um, heating controls and also make, make them more aware of how changing the settings on the thermostat might affect their behavior. So we deployed a number of these sensing systems in homes and, and uh, we designed some energy feedback interfaces to, to help them uh, do that better. Um, we also looked at energy storage. So what would happen if um, every home in the UK is equipped with a battery that allows them to store energy at times when, when energy might be uh, expensive, so in a setting where we have real-time prices, and how to help them converge to a global optimum where we flatten the peaks on the grid. We also looked at formation of virtual power plants, and that's looking at the negotiation processes that I mentioned earlier. We're looking at electric vehicle charge pricing, so this is looking at a setting that has been, uh, as a challenge, that has been posed by the Royal Academy of Engineering, where we need to try and uh, prevent uh, transformers on certain, uh, on, in certain neighborhoods from being overloaded, when everyone's going to plug their electric vehicles um, to charge at night. And also, we designed various algorithms for energy spot grid optimization. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, George Chen, and he's going to be talking to us about um, hydrogen <laughs> dielectrics. That's not mine. Today is about the electrical performance of our dielectrics in a high voltage transformer. And uh, we all know and the transformer is a very important part of the high voltage transmission system. And also it's very expensive as well, as uh, uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, all our current transformers are probably uh, around 50 years old already. And its design life was sort of 30 to 40 years. So kind of uh, run over their time. And, uh, as a result of that, failure does occur, and uh, as especially for AC transformer, and uh, as you can clearly see here, and if a failure, and potentially it could be a, a disaster as well, and which could lead to the blackout, and also cause lots of, uh, sort of damage in terms of economics as well. And uh, currently, if you look at all this failure, and if you, uh, by electrical failure actually counts about the, sort of nearly a third of the, the failure, about 29%. And uh, if you look at this uh, uh, sort of typically designed uh, for the insulation in the transformer, and uh, typically, and uh, when you just been built and you have a lot of insulation margin there, but over the years and due to the aging effect and due to some sort of uh, incident occur in the system, and the life or uh, well, the, the sort of uh, the stress that dielectric can induce uh, gradually reduced over the time. And if you look further, and then sometimes that could be the uh, sort of cause the damage of the uh, uh, dielectrics. And uh, of course, and uh, Steve mentioned earlier, and uh, there's a sort of big project currently going on now is due to the renewable energy and also ship grid, and that part of it is going to be uh, sort of a transfer in the uh, high voltage DC uh, system. And uh, one of the problem with the high voltage DC system, and uh, is uh, well, the, uh, currently it's oil paper is being used in the uh, sort of this insulation system, and uh, because of the DC transformation, and therefore you have this the insulation actually experience of AC and the DC components and, uh, as well, and uh, therefore the problem with the DC is uh, it can easily form sort of a space charge in the system. And if we form the space chart, that chart can modify the, your design field. And that basically leading to possibly early failure. And uh, so here is something, something we are doing in our lab and trying to uh, mimic some of the service condition and trying to look actually look at the status of this uh, dielectrics by looking at the charge dynamics and the amount of charge in the system. 
And uh, so what we, over the years, we have found that actually space charge measurement actually be able to provide some key information about that status of the insulation, therefore can be used to assess uh, the insulation uh, performance. And uh, here uh, in the uh, sort of, uh, Tony Davis High Oxygen Laboratory, we have some unique techniques to analyze uh, materials itself, but also allow us to measure the space charge in particular, and in the dielectric material. And so here are some results I can show you, and uh, that's a sort of system that well, we, we develop. And uh, this is a result for the fresh uh, sort of uh, oil paper sample. But once you have some aged oil paper sample, and what we see there, the charge dynamics clearly changed. And also that not only changed with the uh, aged oil, but also with the moisture as well. So which is uh, some of the moisture is uh, 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 the product of this uh, uh, aging uh, of the oil and the paper. And uh, so because of this, the electrical performance of this oil paper insulation will be deteriorated. And uh, so as a result of that, and we will be able to use this technique to monitor the status of uh, the insulation and therefore determine the lifetime of the insulation. And uh, so over the years, and based on this, and uh, we have uh, do a lot of research on the effect of the space charge and its uh, role in the electrical performance of the this, uh, um, uh, high voltage converter transformer, and uh, also sort of attract sort of findings from the industry and uh, from the national grid, from the manufacturer of stone uh, grid as well. And uh, as a result of this, <coughs> actively involved in this uh, secret sort of working group and try to establish the testing procedure for this uh, new development transform as well. Next up is uh, Jane Tom, who's going to talk about <coughs> problems with wind turbine flows. My name is Vincent here from uh, Air Group. So here is a picture you can see um, the wind turbine sitting in a very complex uh, situation. Uh, you have a turbine band layer and also a wick interacting with each other. So my talk is going to advertise to you. We have developed an uh, efficient method for large egg simulation which can actually predict the flow around the wind turbine or head turbine. And that is a challenge. 
So for the current method, uh, it's still inefficient, it's still a big challenge, and most of the methods don't consider the divergence free. That means they don't consider the UVWs uh, satisfy the kinetic equation, and which pro produce a lot of problems also. So for example, it, uh, they will produce a lot of artificial uh, pressure fluctuations, and also for the obstructive issue, a lot of uh, uh, noise. So we have, for the last few years, we have developed a simple and efficient method to generate UVW uh, for uh, the inflow condition for LEA, for large condition. Basically, you need the real stress, and second, you need the interval main scale of the eddies. And then you can generate the, the UVW, which is correlated in time and in space. And the beauty of this method is much, much faster than all the ones. Also, we recently we tried to solve the artificial fluctuation problem, and which is now significantly reduce the pressure fluctuation. And of course, this uh, can be used for wind turbine, high turbine, and uh, flow over buildings and heat transport. I'll give you uh, two examples. First of all, why we need uh, intro condition. Yeah. First, if you consider a laminar inlet, yeah, so we will focus on a flow of a, a static wind turbine, right? Um, in a normal situation, um, 7 degree and double top, uh, lower number, you can see I have a big bubble. But if you improve the fluctuation at the inlet with correlation, of course, the bubble is significantly reduced. And also, if you check the, um, the, the lift coefficient, this two point is significantly reduced or delayed for this case. One yeah, last one. A quick one. And uh, here I will show you the diverging free problem the, 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 uh, for a channel flow. Yeah, here we consider uh, uh, we don't consider diverging free for a pressure fluctuation along time at some point. Yeah, you can see the artificial fluctuation is enormous. But then if you consider the diamond three, this is the reference data for you slightly from condition. You can see they are there. Also you can check the, the spectra or or the RMS, <coughs> RMS, they are all written. Okay. Thank you. Is Edward, he's going to carry on with the theme of turbulence. So the, the, I should add, it's not just turbulence, in particular it's turbulent combustion here. And the reason why this is an interesting area of research is really, uh, turbulence is, has a long history of research, it's still a completely intractable area. And we're combining that with another area where we're all confused still, which is combustion chemistry. And these two physical phenomena have uh, very interesting interactions. So, why are we still interested in combustion, you may ask. Um, fossil fuels are running out, and we don't really want to burn those that we still have. But the truth is, I don't trust you not to burn the remaining carbon that you can still access easily. So we may as well try and burn it efficiently, and without causing too much harmful emissions. And then, looking into the future, we also need to know how to burn alternative fuels in an efficient way. And probably we'll be developing engines in, specifically in order to um, burn fuels with the characteristics of biofuels or syn gas, or specifically designing power plants so that we can capture the carbon, and that may um, mean that we design combustion processes in a different way as well. So although combustion engines have been really driving um, industry for, for well over 100 years now, we're still at the point where we don't have a very good fundamental grasp and certainly not a predictive capability for, um, for the current and future uh, combustion devices and combustion engines. 
So really this, uh, my, my research, and I'm just a new lecturer at Southampton now, is to work on the modeling of, of combustion processes, um, starting from a fundamental level, but also building up to the, uh, building up models that can be used within design. So the, what this drawing or this image here shows is a visualization of a very large combustion simulation. So this is, uh, until very recently, was the largest ever combustion simulation performed. And why, why would we say that it's large? Okay, so it has, in order to, to form this calculation, we have to solve 35 billion um, ordinary differential equations simultaneously. Why would we need to do that? So turbulence has a lot of scales. So we need a lot of re resolution, a lot of time scales, and, and, and uh, length scales. On top of that, we have a lot of uh, different chemical reactions going on. So we also need to keep track of, uh, to get anything realistic, you know, tens to hundreds of chemical species at the same time. And so this is actually uh, an image from a bit of combustion going on in something the size of a sugar cube. So it's not even a realistic system. But this is really the limit of what modern computers can do. And this was run on, at the time, the largest supercomputer in the world. So we have this issue where if you want to do a fundamental study, we have to use all the resources available in the world, and we can still do something impractical. But we might still learn something from a calculation like this. So for example, this is a, a fuel jet issuing to a hot environment of air. And it's similar to what happens in a diesel engine. You throw fuel in, and then it bursts into flames somewhere further down. But the exact position where it bursts into flames, um, and how much mixing with the hot air happens before it does so, determines how much nitrous oxide you are going to emit. And so, because we do this numerically, and it's still not possible to make these measurements experimentally, I might add, um, we can also do some interesting things, like put in these, these little balls are uh, fictitious tracer particles. So, this process of pollution formation <coughs> isn't an instantaneous process. It depends on the history that that bit blob of fluid has as it goes along and gets turbulently mixed with the air and the fuel. So this is the kind of information we can extract from these very fundamental studies. But then the challenge is really um, how to use this understanding and put it in something that doesn't take all the, uh, 50, 50 million um, hours of computing time, but something that an engineer can run on his desktop. And so uh, as part of a um, fellowship now, which is running, is now underway, funded by the SRC um, in collaboration with Rolls-Royce, um, we're formulating a, a modeling framework that tends to do just that, with a multi-scale modeling framework that includes these very small-scale mixing processes within a, a statistical description um, that can be extended up to much larger scales. So I'll leave it there. So our next presentation, number 21 on the list, is from Enrico, uh, and he's going to show us how we visualise electricity consumption, which in my case is when the teenagers walk through the front door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a relatively new lecturer in uh, electronics and computer science. My research is in uh, human-computer interaction. So my interest is in how um, people understand their own er energy consumption and therefore how can they better uh, reduce it or, or optimize it depending on which political camp uh, you come from. Um, so we started uh, from the observation that most 
current electricity meters focus on instantaneous consumption. They tell you what's going on right now. Fine, so maybe you can switch off a few light bulbs. But the bulk of, of, of consumption that you can play with is actually from appliances like dishwasher and washing machine, which vary over time. And so we think that it's a lot more interesting to look at historical consumption. So if you look at a few of the existing examples, like the power meter, show it, they show you graphs like this one. This is basically consumption over time. Now, this is not, uh, as, as scientists and engineers, we can understand this quite well, and we can uh, calculate the interval of this curve and understand like, how different uh, things um, fare in terms of consumption. But this is not as readable as it could be. There are techniques to try and make sense of this kind of, of diagrams automatically, but they are not um, that developed yet. It's still an unsolved problem. So we notice that, uh, however, there's information here that makes sense from a human point of view in a, in a qualitative way. So if you look at this, you can see that there are peaks that somehow tell you that there's something going on. Now, if you look at the time, you can probably remember, if this is your own plot, what those um, activities correspond to. So what we did is um, design an interface to um, have people, oops, sorry, um, be able to, to, to allow people to annotate this graph. So you can do something as simple as this. This is actually the plot of, of my apartment. You can just draw something and say, okay, this is a shower. Um, sorry, it's a bit slow, but you will get there. Um, you can also annotate things that maybe uh, have a certain meaning for you as a person and wouldn't, um, any computer will not be able to, to, to uh, annotate in the same way. So for example, this is actually uh, an activity that I would define as dinner. Because I had a couple of uh, people around for dinner uh, on Saturday evening, and that involves um, using different appliances and then like a dishwasher at the end of the evening. Um, so if you go on and annotate more and more, then you can actually <coughs> present the same information in a different way. So in this case, each box represents um, one event, and the size of the box represents how much energy was consumed by that specific event. So the dinner here uh, took a lot more than, say, uh, showers or cat usage. By doing this kind of thing, for example, I was able to see that sometimes my stupid electric shower can consume a lot more than my dishwasher. So if, if I want to try and save electricity, maybe doing less dish dishwashers uh, uh, per week um, would not make as much of a difference as, as like taking sure the showers or, or replacing the shower and put up to the put up to the main shower. So uh, what you see here is also like the, the, the always on en energy and the and the, um, the not annotated energy. Um, so the way that the system is implemented is actually quite uh, uh, simple. We're quite proud of the fact that we are only using off-the-shelf technology. Uh, we use these uh, alertness sensors, which are uh, um, uh, sold for about 50 pounds, and then it's all essentially like web technology, so JavaScript and, and Python and, and Java for web server. So this allowed us to run very cheaply a field trial. We deployed the system for um, about four weeks in 12 homes with volunteers from, from the university, and we were very excited to see that a lot of what we expected was actually confirmed. So people relate very uh, quickly and easily with this idea of annotating things. And even though many of them actually had, had uh, a previous experience with the, with the energy meters, they were able to learn new things. And also, this visualization of boxes really worked like we, like we hoped for. So we had people describing uh, energy with their hands. So they were talking about the fact that like, the TV consumes so much, but then when I had the, the skybox on, I, it was like this big. Which, which you know, uh, indicates that, that, that it's something that is easier to, to grasp and discuss. So this is just the start, and I wanted to give a flavor of what kind of work we are doing. But we see a lot of opportunities for expanding this, from uh, using pattern recognition to automatically detect events after you annotate a few of them, to using agents that may take advantage of these annotations to give you advice about how to shift your consumption, um, to look into into way to make the system multi-user, either collaboration inside the home or inside the office, what different people consume, to actually try to balance the load across multiple houses, and can we try to flatten the load and get a better a better energy uh, bill from that? 
to larger scale samples, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We got a paper accepted at Ubicon 2012, so if you want to know more, uh, you can find more information there. Okay. The main research question we have is uh, can communication initiatives make a measurable contribution to the net domestic energy savings? And if so, how? Um, and as you can see here, it's quite an interdisciplinary uh, research project combining both social scientists and engineers and uh, a few of these human beings. I'm just going to write here. I'm reflecting for The main kind of bulk of which is, is a field experiment in which we've got two communities um, in the south of England, one of which are a treatment group. Um, we've given an insulation upgrade, um, both capital wall and loft insulation, and alert uh, monitoring system. Um, and we also have a control group who we've also given the insulation upgrade and the alert group as well. The difference being um, that our treatment group is also engaged with a legal group. In this screening group, they, it was a pre-existing group, it's not something that came about for the research they were looking at, and they're interested in kind of engaging the community, um, generally green issues, from food, transport, but also energy. Um, so what the green group has been doing so far um, since the research started, which was 2010, is they've held a series of <coughs> events for the household where they talked about reducing base load um, in people's energy use. Um, they've also touched on issues of climate change. Um, and they've also been running an energy users group um, where members of the community that are part of the project can come together to discuss um, their, their base load, how they use energy, what they do, what they might be different and things like that. This is one of the events um, such as community. So for the research, we are taking um, a longitudinal treatment measurement of household energy use before heating the system. Um, so alongside kind of the normal quantity of data collection as well, we're also running um, regular surveys of consumption practices and attitude networks to see whether um, the networks that people are part of also influence their energy use and their own life. And also we are running a series of quality of interviews with in detail what difference um, kind of their engagement with the community group has made with how they use energy in their homes. Um, you know, it's made any difference at all to their view. Um, and running alongside this main third experiment, there's also a comparative stream of research um, that we're doing, which is looking at an array of community um, groups. Across the country, um, ranging from uh, micro generation groups um, to transition towns to um, kind of provide context 